last seminar of the year for the Deakin Science and Society Networks online seminar series. My name is Tao Fan and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization. I'm also the program coordinator for the Science and Society Network and along with the SSN leadership team have been working hard behind the scenes all year to help put together this brilliant program of online events. Today, it's my pleasure to be chairing, to, chairing the seminar on cultures of hyperproductivity and the quantification of work with the president of the Cultural Studies Association of Australia, Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens. But before we begin, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm standing uh, in this particular slice of Melbourne, Australia, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. And I'd also like to extend that respect and acknowledge the Indigenous traditional owners of all the places that you're listening from today. So for those of you who have not attended one of our seminars, uh, a quick rundown on the structure for today's event. I'll introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Stevens. Elizabeth will present for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some discussant comments from Dr. Alex Roginski and Dr. Nikki Ridges before we then throw to a general discussion and Q&A from the audience. I'll be chairing the discussion here on Zoom and my colleague and the convener of the SSN, Dr. Timothy Neal, will be moderating the YouTube live chat. We're keen to hear all your questions, uh, so, if you, so you can either post those into the YouTube chat, send to us on Twitter at SSN Deacon, and make sure you use the hashtag SSN Seminar, or you can also email your questions through using the email address at ssn-info at deacon.edu.au. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Elizabeth Stevens is an Associate Professor of Cultural Studies and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow in the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland. She's the author of three monographs, Normality, a Critical Genealogy, co-authored with Peter Kreil, Anatomy, a Spectacle, Public Exhibitions for the Body from 1700 to the Present, and Queer Writing, Homoeroticism in Jean Genet's Fiction. Her future fellowship examines the history of collaboration between the arts and sciences as a site of shared experimentation and transdisciplinary knowledge production. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Tao, for the introduction. And Deacon for putting this on. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share this work. It feels very timely for me. I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded land of the Yugur and the Turrbal uh, people and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging as well. So as Tao said, um, I'm working on a future fellowship at the moment, um, which is exploring experimental practices as a site of intersection and collaboration between the arts and sciences. And you'll see that um, reflected in my presentation today. But what I found so far from this research is that this site of intersection is also often the site of concepts and practices that have a really far reaching um, cultural effect and have a broad cultural um, dispersion. Uh, and the idea of productivity uh, is one of these. And this is the, uh, the concept that I'm looking at today. So this is very much in progress um, work and it's been an interesting time, the year of the pandemic, to be working um, on ideas of productivity. So I really invite your questions or comments or um, reflections um, after this talk today. Okay, so during the first of the decades of the 20th century, the industrial engineers and management consultants, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, undertook a series of photographic time motion studies of work that they called chronocyclographs. And you're looking at one of these um, right now. The purpose of these images was to make visible the movements of workers, mostly but not exclusively manual laborers, as you see here, as they perform the key tasks of their job. So that could be labeling boxes, stamping papers, filling cans, and so on, um, in order to identify any wasted movement that um, increased, decreased their productivity or increased fatigue. So here's an example of a surgeon um, sewing, for instance. So what you can see with these images are the kind of motion powers. What they did was attach small lamps to the wrists of their subjects, so in this case, a surgeon, and then they filmed them working in semi-darkness using time-lapse photography. And what you see here is the product of that. <laughs> 
What the Gilbreths argued was that wasted movement was made visible in the tangles of messy lines that you can see in motion parts like this one. Um, and they argued that there's a lot of redundancy that becomes visible in the motions of workers through images such as this. So they say their chronocyclographs revealed inefficiencies in movement um, that would increase either increase fatigue or de decrease productivity. So they're interested in both of those things. Here's another example um, of a bricklayer. Um, and again, you can see there's a lot of redundancies um, in their motions. Bricklayers is one of Frank Gilbreth's most famous um, case studies. Efficient movement, they said, on the other hand, was immediately recognisable by its streamlined form. And again, you see the motion paths of the lamps here, but they're tracing a much smaller um, arc. So the Gilbreths argued that by reducing the number of motions required to complete each task in the workplace, they could double or even triple the outputs of workers. They called their method of, of any way to the best way to perform any motion, the one best That's their big kind of contribution to industrial management as a field. So the purpose of their cyclographs was to identify and eliminate industrial waste in the form of inefficient movement. But what they meant by waste here was actually something pretty new as a cultural concept. They didn't mean waste as in terms of idleness or in terms of squandering a resource that already existed. Rather, waste for them was a kind of untapped margin of potential between current levels of productivity and the maximum productivity it was possible to achieve or to engineer. And it was eliminating this gap between actual and potential productivity that is the key aim of their practice as, as industrial um, managers. After the Gilbreths, levels of productivity in the, in the workplace will always be measured against an imagined uh, possible. So that, that's their contribution to, uh, to industrial engineering and workplace management. So I'm interested in the Gilbreth's chronocyclographs because they provide us with a rich visual archive of, of the document, the very moment that the productivity machine springs into being, trapping workers inside it. So we can see the moment that this occurs in the actual images that the Gilbreths um, produce. So here we can see the time management expert entering the scene of work. It's always Frank Gilbreth that one sees in these images. You never see Lillian Gilbreth, who did the work with him, as the, as the expert in the images, although she sometimes uh, represents the subject. Um, but we see the, the image of the time management expert here coming to enter the scene of work and encircling uh, the body of the worker with their new, technology, uh, their new technologies and their recording devices and so on. So in this presentation, what I wanna focus on is the way the Gilbreth's chronocyclographs represent the convergence of two key cultural developments at the start of the 20th century. The first is the new use of um, recording technologies, as we see here, to measure and visualise the body. And with it, the new application of quantified forms of knowledge making around which were elaborated new ideas about productivity and optimization and the importance and value of efficiency. So we see um, in these striking images that the Gilbreths produced um, at the start of the century, we see in them revealed to the human eye something new, not just the visualization of a body in motion, but rather the luminous traces of movement itself, often abstracted from the body in and as streaks of light. And it's this representation of the body as a field of energy or a line of force that enables the idea of productivity and the logic of optimization that drives the Gilbreth's work uh, to emerge. And so this is what I want to um, examine in this presentation. So let me start by giving you some context about the kind of work that the Gilbreths were doing. So they were um, industrial management consultants and part of a new and lucrative um, field of research at the start of the 20th century that called itself scientific management. 
This phrase itself is generally accredited to Frederick Taylor, whose um, 1911 book, The Principles of Scientific Management, proposed the replacement of what was then the dominant rule of thumb managerial method, which was shaped by practical experience in a particular workplace and personal um, evaluation. And he replaced these with quantitative methods that could be applied more generally and rested, he said, upon clearly defined rules, laws and principles as a foundation. So Taylor said that scientific management required a shift in prevailing managerial practices away from a practice-led um, reliance on individual judgment and a familiarity with a particular profession or practice and towards a much more math mathematically and outputs. So the purpose of scientific management was to find ways to increase both, both speed and outputs. So this required the introduction of a new type of management, the, the efficiency expert or the time management, time manager, whose job was to measure, assess and improve worker productivity. The body under scientific management was one thus continually subjected to new practices and technologies of measurements uh, and surveillance that monitored productivity which was measured increasingly in purely quantitative terms that were always expected to increase. For Taylor, he undertook this measurement with a stopwatch and a rule and a slide rule. For the Gilbreths, it was undertaken with a camera and a clock, as we've already seen. But whether there were upper limits to the increase in productivity or indeed other non-quantitative factors to take into account when managing the workplace, whether all industries should be geared towards constant growth, none of these questions were addressed in either the Gilbreths or the Taylors' um, work. Rather, the foundational principle of scientific management was that worker productivity could always be quantified and could always be expected to increase. Now, we know where this history leads, of course, because we are living uh, in that moment. Um, and what we have seen is the way that the ideas that um, emerge in terms of managing uh, the factory assembly lines then get applied to office settings and, and into the knowledge worker um, industry um, as well. So, so we know where this, where this history leads to. It leads to the history of 20th and 21st century time management. But what I want to do in this presentation uh, is to not look forward, but rather to look back and to examine the lesser known visual and cultural histories from which the Gilbreth Project um, emerged. To understand the significance of these images I want to show and to understand the broader impact that their, um, their photographs came to have, it's helpful to recover the history of scientific photographic research from which their project of, science, uh, of chronocyclography developed. So let's move back in time then. The Gilbreths were not the first people to experiment with photographic time motion studies of the body. This person was Etienne Jules Marais, is uh, one of the inventors of photography in France and in fact um, a very clear uh, photographic and visual um, influence on the Gilbreth's work. So we see how their chronocyclographs had a clear and famous precedent uh, in these earlier photographic motion studies that were undertaken um, in the very final decades of the 19th century Jules Marais. Have a look at another one of his works. So the influence of Marais's work on the Gilbreths is evident very visually. So Marais's images, like the Gilbreths, provided striking visualization of motion paths that are not otherwise uh, visible to the human eye. And they're captured in luminous lines of force by the new technology of the stop motion um, camera. Marais' photographs, like the Gilbreths, developed a full range um, of motion in a single image. And so we see a series of, of images here. I'll return to some of these, but we can see that continuity of the full range of motion um, is shown in, the, in, in a single frame. So Marais called his time motion studies 
chronophotographs. And so we can assume that the, uh, the Gilbreths derive their own term, chronocyclographs, from Marais term. Although I have to say, they don't attribute this anywhere in their work. They don't mention Marais work. Uh, there's a couple of mentions in footnotes here and there, but they, and in fact, they deny when people ask them. Sometimes they say they were developing their own methods uh, simultaneously, but there is a photo of Gilbreth at the front of Marais Institute. So it's a little hidden uh, heritage because they had patented, of course, their own uh, techniques. So they were very keen to, uh, to kind of claim originality, but I think we can see <laughs> the influence right here. So recovering the Gilbreth's unacknowledged depth to Marais' earlier photographic studies um, of motion thus helps us understand, as I want to show, the wider context from which their own work emerged in two key ways. Firstly, it elucidates the central role played by visual technologies in establishing practices of measuring and quantifying bodies at this time. And secondly, it draws attention to the context in which transforming bodies into sources of numerical data came to be established and recognized as part of scientific practice in the second half of the 19th century. So this is what I'm gonna show you um, in this section here. So many of Marais' uh, time motion um, photographic studies featured this man, his preparator, his assistant, uh, Gilbert Demeny. And so this is what he did to make his photos. Marais dressed Demeny, as you see him here, in a black suit. And then he affixed paper circles to his joints and bits of white string uh, in between those. Um, and then he photographed them in a range of actions. So these are, we've seen a couple of these um, already, but this is an example of Demony uh, jumping here. So we see images of him jumping, he's walking, he's sitting on a chair. Um, these are some other examples. Um, and Marais uses, you can tell these are obviously early, and you can see the, the, the extent to which the movement is abstracted um, in the photographs that Marais was taking. Photography itself is, of course, in a very experimental um, stage at this time, and Marais invented his own um, device to do this, his fusil photographique, his photographic um, rifle, which he invented to, to take the photos that you've just seen. And in France, this is widely recognised as the, the first moving image um, technology. So it was um, the, the Lumiere brothers, for instance, went to Marais studio and saw this and used that to devise their own um, moving image technologies um, down the track. So, but Marais' purpose in, um, in making these photographs was to study the mechanics of motion. He was a physiologist and also one of the most eminent scientific um, figures in France in the mid 19th century. So at various times, he was a president of the academies of both medicine and science and of aero navigation and of photography, all the different um, periods, but his field was, um, was physiology. Many of his photographs um, of Demony focus on physical activity, which is a reflection of this, such as running and jumping, as we've already seen. Um, and so their, their purpose is, um, as I've said, to reveal the mechanics of movements. So like the Gilbreth chronocyclographs, Marais' chronophotographs were intended to make visible the mechanics of a body's movement by obscuring the moving body itself in order to illuminate the motion powers. So we see this here where we can see the, the effect of that white string and those um, circles and we can see that the motion itself um, is then captured as a series of uh, geometric lines and from that Marais could take various experiments um, on the and so he could do calculations um, on the and, and turn this the image that you see here into numerical data. But what I want to draw your attention to is that physiology itself um, at this period represented what was a radically new approach to the study of the body and biology. Whereas earlier fields of medical research, such as anatomy, um, for instance, derived much of their knowledge of the body from the dissection of cadavers. And so they understood biological structures and organization to be relatively fixed and stable, although of course subject to aging, disease, deformity, um, and so on. But physiology is quite different and it's a new field of research at this time. And it focuses on the dynamic properties of living bodies. So it examined forces that were largely internal um, and thus invisible to the human eye. 
as a consequence of this, physiology actually became a kind of, in the physiology laboratory in particular, became a hotbed for the invention of new measuring devices and imaging technologies um, at this time. So this is a fairly standard late 19th, early 20th century um, physiology lab. Do, does Um, processes of the bodies using um, various technologies. Here is Marie himself in his own laboratory. He was a keen um, inventor of technology. So you can see he's surrounded um, by some of his devices here. In France, the, the device that he's probably most famous for, apart from, of course, his, um, his stop motion um, the photographic camera, is this one here, the cinemograph. Um, and this is, this is a portable uh, device, as you can see. And you can see exactly how it works on the image here. So we have a little stylus. Um, that sits against the pulse and a little plate here. And then it is simply the, the stylus is being moved up and down by the movement of the pulse. And then it's producing in real time data from the from the body uh, prior to this vivisection was the way that you found out information like this so it's a bit of a leap forward to actually see the internal workings of the body from the outside. So, so this is how, how it worked. It, it produces data um, in real time. Um, and of course, it had an immediate impact um, on, on work in France. And in fact, his, his invention of the graphic method, is, like Mary is a person who invents the medical graph. And this is the, the device that he uses to do that. So he has a, a huge influence in the medical um, profession um, for this reason. So, so we, we should really understand this mimograph then as an, as an early medical imaging technology. It's designed to produce a visual record of biological processes that are internal to the body um, using what was then um, the new method of graphic inscription. But what I want to stress about this moment is that um, people didn't necessarily embrace this when uh, Marais in, uh, invented this, uh, this technology. In fact, it was the, the, the object of considerable professional resistance. Um, and this was in large part because along with uh, visual imaging technology, Marais simultaneously introduced quantified forms of data collection. You can see him doing that with the, gra uh, the graph that you can see. data collection and analysis to medical thinking in a way that many people in the medical profession assume to be at odds with the necessarily evaluative nature of medical diagnosis that was dominant at the time. So he was seeking to replace human observation with mechanical inscription. And Marais himself acknowledged somewhat ruefully that he knew that his colleagues um, believed him to be devaluing human reason and intelligence in favor of machines. So it was quite unpopular um, at the time. Critiques like this about the use of measuring um, devices and recording devices and the usefulness of quantitative forms of knowledge that underpinned them remain trenchant in many forms of scientific research until way into the end of the 19th century. Um, and Peter Kreil and I looked at this a bit in the book that Tao mentioned um, in introducing me on um, the book on normality um, and the, the period in which there's a resistance to quantified forms of thinking in science and medicine really does endure um, for a very long time. In 19th century medicine, the idea that mathematical formula and laws of numerical regularity could provide better and more useful information than that gained by individual observation and hone professional judgment was often greeted with the outright derision. Quantitative data and mechanical measuring devices were not yet widely accepted to provide useful insight or knowledge about the body. It's only at the end of the 19th century, as Mary Poovey has shown in the history of the modern fact, that the number definitively came to usurp the fact as the key unit of, of knowledge making across the sciences and the quantitative became fully established as more objective and scientific than the evaluative. Marais work and particularly his chronophotographs help us better understand how and where numbers became productive at the end of the 19th century. And thus they elucidate the key role played by visual technologies in the rise of quantification as a privileged form of knowledge production at this time. So Murray himself um, invented uh, 
print photography quite experimentally after he went through a series of um, initial sort of prototyping um, and attempts to, to record the, the movement and the metrics of the body. So this is one of his pneumatic devices, um, which I absolutely love. So it's using air and the, the, um, the running man here has got, um, has got sensors on the bottom of his, uh, of his shoes. So as he's walking at places pressure against the air tubes, which are then recording into the device that you can see here. These ones were quite limited. So these ones didn't work so well. So then he moved on to um, onto using uh, photography. And this is one of his earliest um, experiments here. Um, this is one that he was um, images that he took of birds in flight. There's some of the earliest um, corner photographs that he took and they're super famous because he discovered something new through taking these. And this is that I mentioned that he was the president of the Aero Navigation Society in France. This is why, because at the time people thought the bird's wings flapped up and down and they were trying to invent the plane. So they were wondering if plane wings should flap up and down. And the ray showed that no the figure of eight movement, which he did with photography um, to show. He thought that he might be able to develop planes the same way, but that uh, that one didn't uh, come to pass. So, so these were considered revolutionary uh, when they were released in France, and they showed the power of what photography could do. But these images are not actually taken by Marais himself. They are taken by someone who's much more famous, perhaps, than uh, Marais, which is Muirbridge, uh, the photographer who is best known for taking these images here. So Muirbridge is the American uh, photographer. He took these photographic studies of galloping horses in the 1870s. Actually, he was influenced by Marais' books when he uh, made these. Um, and these are also hailed as being scientific scientifically revelatory because they also showed something new about the mechanics of movement. And that is at the time, people wondered whether horses legs when they were at a full gallop were fully extended um, and so whether they were fully extended how they were how the legs were positioned in relation to the galloping horse and so this is what people thought that the legs were fully that when a horse was at its full gallop that the legs were far apart but if you can see here at its full spread, you can see that when the horse is going fastest here, you can see that the legs are right underneath. So in showing the mechanics of movement, you can see this is the only time when all four legs come off the ground here is when the legs are underneath. Whereas if you look at this image here, the legs are all off the ground, but they're far apart. So again, Muirbridge showed something about the mechanics of movement that people had wondered about for a long time, but didn't know through the, through the use um, of photography. So, so what's really interesting about this is that both Marais and Weybridge's work showed that new visual uh, technologies like photography had an important application to scientific research because the images are constitutive of new knowledge. They're not just illustrative of new knowledge. But despite the similarities between these um, two projects, the Muybridge and Marais actually um, produce very different kinds of um, visualizations of movement, um, and they produce very different kinds of images as a result. So Muybridge's images all look like this. They're chronological, they're sequential, they depict motion as a series of discrete actions. But Marais are super impositional like the gill breast. They depict a continuous line um, of a full range of a given movement in a single image. So that's the, uh, the consistent factor of his work. Let me just go back for a sec. So these images um, are significant because they draw attention to the fact that there were no existing conventions for representing movement at the time, um, and that it's invented in the work that we're seeing here. But it's Muirbridge's work that would become foundational to the new visual culture that developed around moving image technologies and narrative cinema. And so he, Muirbridge himself made these. He liked to make animations um, of his photographs. Um, and then so he would use this using um, a fanatic scope in the uh, in 1878 he made this one to show animations of his work and he also made what is said to be the first commercial showing of a projected moving image um, and he did this one at 1890 
fair to much um, acclaim. But what I want, the reason I want to um, to show you these is that what he's doing is um, in making these sort of moving images so that simulated movement as the eye would see it. What I want to point out is this is quite the opposite to quite opposed to Marais' project, which was to make visible the mechanics of motion itself. So if we compare, much fast. Um, if we compare, we can see that these are these are opposite ways of showing um, motion. That Melray wanted to show all the all the steps that Marie Ridge wanted to uh, to face in using um, moving images. Um, and this is because Nore had very little interest in the in the commercial development of moving image technologies, although he is, as I mentioned, widely recognised as the founder of the cinematic um, moving image technologies in France. But his work did change how people understood bodies and it, it, they produced a kind of aesthetic fascination with representations of energy um, and efficiency. So we see this most, fa most famously, perhaps, in Marcel Duchamp's new descending um, a staircase case where we can see that same sort of fragmentation um, of the body in movement um, but we also see it more generally in in the kind of cubist and futurist um, artwork at the time um, in which bodies are represented as these sort of geometric angles and lines of force um, in the way that we see in Marais work. So although Marais images wouldn't become part of a dominant um, visual conventions of photography and the moving image in the 20th century, his representations of lines of force did have a wide, um, widespread cultural effect, far beyond anything that Marais was interested um, in. Um, and this served to establish, as I want to show in the next part of this paper, quantitative approaches to the study of the body and the way they become embedded in the chronophotographic project and extend these into a much wider range of cultural spaces. And it's this history that I've discovered that directly enabled the rise of the efficiency movements at the start of 20th century. So I want to return to, um, to look at that now. So Marais' photographs um, enabled the motion to be measured and timed and the body's mechanics to be quantified. And they did so through use of new technologies that um, informed the visual and intellectual cultures of his time. In this way, chronophotography established an association between a particular aesthetics um, of movement abstracted from bodies and streaks of light or geometrical angles and a project of quantification and measuring bodily mechanics that would become integral to the project of quantification that underpin the rise of efficiency and optimization in 20th century workplace management. So the Gilbreths, to return to them, were the direct beneficiaries, as I want to show now, um, of Marais' research. Their work represented the same convergence of visualization and quantification of the body seen in Marais' chronophotographs while relocating these into um, an industrial context. But despite the visual similarities between the Marais and Gilbreth's work, their projects and professions were very different. The Gilbreth drew Marais' work and they benefited from the association of photography and measuring devices with mechanical precision and objective scientific uh, objective um, scientificity that was established in 19th century physiology, but they did something different with it. Their work was commercial rather than scientific. And despite the use of the, way, the word scientific management to describe um, their practice, their work mostly had an industrial and commercial application. Where Marais' work was designed to observe and describe, the Gilbreth's purpose was to correct and prescribe. And this difference is manifested in the key compositional difference between Marais' work and that of the Gilbreth um, with an image that I've already shown, the inclusion of the efficiency or time management expert into the scene of the work. Now, the Gilbreths claimed, um, as did Frederick Taylor, that their techniques allowed productivity by um, engineering the, the efficiency of the work in this way to increase at an exponential rate. 
So in his most famous case study, Frank Gilbert showed that a bricklayer could double the rate of bricks laid from 350 to 700 bricks per hour by first stacking them on a suspended uh, trolley. His height could be adjusted as he worked rather than bending down to brick up, uh, pick up bricks uh, individually. And that's now uh, widespread um, practice. Um, but they also extended their work into uh, the early work of the office place. And so here we see someone who is whose job is to date pieces of paper, the requisition orders of pieces of paper. So we just saw them doing it in their um, original way, um, a one-handed stamping um, of a piece of paper. And now here's the Gilbreth engineering this to be more um, productive, 21%, I think they said faster. Um, and now using two hands, but now they're introducing a foot pedal as well. 3,050 pieces of paper apparently can be stamped in this way. And then they go on to look at um, other examples of how to polish soap, for instance, is that one there? And they do this with every um, line um, of work. Um, so through any kind of case study, they say they can increase two, three times um, the amount of people, um, the amount of work that people are doing. I, I sometimes think that modern, uh, you know, office and knowledge work is a cognitive version of what we have just <laughs> seen here. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is, that was their kind of practice in action. That, that's a film, by the way, um, made by the Gilbreths themselves to, to publicise their work. So perhaps unsurprisingly, um, this practice of constant surveillance and standardisation of movement that was designed to extract as much energy and outputs from each um, body as, as possible appealed to managers rather more than it did to workers um, and it was controversial in its own time. So when Taylor's The Principles of Scientific Management was published in um, 1911, it was a subject of sustained critique with Taylor accused of attempting to turn men into um, machines um, and the Gilbreth's chronocyclographs and, and these films as well provide a striking visualisation of this extractive approach to the bodies and its energies and one of the things that it makes visible a celebration of speed and technology is a body that has reduced to a blur of speed that's become a kind of trapped inside a, a machine where the human individual the human body itself has become this kind of rush of toxic acceleration and all that's left is the energy that they have uh, to to produce um, factory workers did uh, push back against their ideas and practices and and both the Gilbreth and Taylor um, acknowledged this in their case studies Taylor for instance accused workers Workers of going slow um, as a form of resistance, although one might actually question the sustainability of turbocharged work that they suggested over a long period of time. And indeed, both the Gilbreths and the Taylors' claims to uh, triple and quadruple factory outputs have since been challenged, and there's considerable evidence that the, the projected increases were based on short-term results and creative mathematics. It is not at all clear, writes Elspeth Brown in the corporate eye, that workers reduced motions remained at a modernist premium once the Gilbreths moved on to other consultancies. Um, and Matthew Stewart has recounted how Taylor conducted his famous experiments on pig iron loading um, by rounding up the burliest workers on site, instructing them to work at their fastest possible speed for an hour, and then multiplying uh, the results according to the length of the work day, work day, and then sometimes further adjusting the figures for reasons that he never um, specified. Uh, so he, he, he leaves like there's this sort of um, trail of mathematical formula strewn throughout all of his um, books, but the, those formulas seem to serve a largely rhetorical function. And as Matthew um, Stewart writes, his actual figures were, I quote, the result of multiplying an irrelevant and uncontrolled experimental observation with a big blob of fudge. So early time management and efficiency experts place their claims to scientific accuracy and objectivity uh, on their capacity to measure and quantify bodies and their productivity. But many of these claims were based on an appearance of mathematical precision. The scientificity um, is one that the Gilbreth chronocyclographs played an important role in establishing. 
the images looked convincingly scientific in a way that appealed to a general public. Um, and this is in fact their main purpose in the Gilbreth's work. So you can see with examples like this, you have these gridded backgrounds, you have these sort of, you know, bits of technology in there, these measuring dev devices and so on. Um, and so these are there to, uh, to represent the scientificity um, of their work. And they claim an instrumentalist position for their images, but the primary purpose of the images themselves is actually to serve as a form of um, publicity for, for their work. So the productivity machine that they created and the culture of hyper-productivity and datafication um, to which this has given rise is a product of this particular moment where the scientific and the commercial, the visual and the quantificatory meet and give rise to a progressivist logic of optimization, efficiency and improvement. So to conclude then, we might think then that in the, the present moment, during the chaos and the upheaval of the current pandemic that we find ourselves in, that this might be the moment in which we would look again at this, uh, this logic of constant increase, this, this workplace always measured in measurable numbered units, and that this might be the moment in which it might come under more pressure. The dysfunctions of modern forms of scientific management with their constant forms of data collection, their quantified assessments um, can be, as we know, often completely counterproductive. And I'm citing here the, the very opposite um, title of Mel Gregg's recent wonderful study of time management practices called um, counterproductive. Uh, these are uh, these counterproductive forms of, of quantified um, management are something with which we're all too familiar today. So why, why is it still existing even in the present moment? This is, this is what I wanna conclude on because I think it's the logic that's underlying this that continues to drive it. The logic of constant optimization and improvement that is extremely insidious. So the, and I think it's insidious for reasons that also come out of the Gilbreth's work. The influence of their work isn't only found in, in workplace management, rather like Marais' work, uh, it seeps out <laughs> of the domain of industrial management and into the practices of everyday life. Time management in the work of the Gilbreths becomes a kind of life management. And it's this that has proved an enormously alluring idea. To waste time, they argued in fatigue study, is to waste life itself. That's a quote. Now, it's this extension of time management into life management that I think is the, the reason their work is so embedded. And it's driven by Lillian Gilbreth and her focus on the psychological aspects of workplace management. Lillian Gilbreth completed what was one of the first um, PhDs in psychology in the USA. She's a founding figure in the work of industrial psychology. And it's her work that shows how the Gilbreth principles of efficiency and optimization could be extended into everyday life. Um, unsurprisingly, most of her work is out of print now, and a lot of the books that she wrote, uh, co wrote with Frank Gilbert, are attributed to him alone. But she, I think, is the reason that her work is so um, influential. Her book showed how practices of self management and increased efficiency could be used to manage the home with increasingly complex and de um, demanding, uh, the, the increasingly complex demands of, of 20th century life happening all around. In her 1927 book, The Homemaker and Her Job, she argued that the time um, gained by introducing efficiency measures into the home allowed more time for leisure. And that, that that time could be measured in what she calls happiness minutes. Efficiency and optimization could be used to improve all aspects of life, she argued. Effective household management, she wrote, um, which, which involved overseeing the family's little people to, to complete their share of the domestic chores, um, increase the happiness minutes available for the mother, who's the presumed reader of her book, allowing them to take a country stroll or attend the cinema alone, to give some of her examples. The important thing, she said, about maximising efficiency was to introduce an overall balance in life. If, you, if you're too busy for too long, you should rest to compensate. If you're too sociable, you should have some time along and so on. And it's this, I think, that is the influence um, of their work. That 
what Lillian Gilbreth suggested was that the competing demands of the workplace, uh, the domestic and social spheres and personal life could be successfully uh, juggled through a judicious use of one time. And it's that, I think, that has proved an enormously appealing and seductive idea for so many, especially in the current environment of hyperproductivity and constant um, busyness. It offers a chance for individual control in the face of systemic problems, and it also works. <laughs> so it does, in fact, help if you are over busy to, to know how to effectively manage your time. So even as they introduced measures for hyper busyness, they also offered a way to help control and balance your life in the midst of all this. This, I think, is that idea of, of time management is an example of what Lauren Blant has so uh, influentially called cool optimism. It holds out the hope for living a good life, even in the midst of the kind of acceleration um, of extractive uh, capitalism. And, and it offers us the chance to reap more happiness minutes if only we take this um, on board. So, so to conclude with then, uh, what I would like to say is that the, the ideas of productivity and the ideas of optimization that drive this are enforced, but they're also internalized. The idea that optimization is always beneficial and everywhere to, become, uh, to be pursued has become so entrenched, so strongly associated with the fulfillment of a potential now understood to be personal as well as professional, that it seems perverse to argue against it. The, the gap between our actual and potential productivity or subjectivity has become a goad to constant practices of self-measuring and self-improvement. This year, it seems, everyone could certainly do with some extra happiness minutes, but it's our internalization of that same logic of optimization and quantified thinking that is driving the productivity machine. And so I think that to disrupt one, we may have to disrupt the other. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Amazing. That was so brilliant. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to give you a round of applause because I feel like a round of applause is so rare to hear <laughs> these days. Um, so what I'll do is um, I'll just invite the audience if you have any questions to begin posting them now. But to help get us started in our discussions, I'm going to introduce uh, a few discussants. So the first is Dr. Alex Roginski, who is a historian, writer and research fellow based in the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization, and whose work focuses on practices of the body. She combines methods from social, cultural and ethnographic history to bring new perspectives to the history of science and the role of authority and professional boundaries. Her forthcoming book, Science and Power in the 19th Century Tasman World, Popular Phrenology in, in the Antipodes, examines the role of the science of head reading in the social fabric of Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand, and will be published through the Cambridge University Press's Science and History series. So Alex, um, if, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, and Elizabeth, thank you very much. Um, any comments you'd like to give on that brilliant paper? Thanks so much, Tao, and um, thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, there's just so many questions that um, pop up for me, and certainly your um, con concluding comments um, sum up one of the driving questions for me in my projects about how um, these sciences that have um, deep genealogies, in my case, um, phrenology and character, they exist in this tension for us between the control, um, which happens when we become systematized, because this is really about um, systematizing, automating the body, and the pleasure that we get, the pleasure from the sense of self-mastery, control. Um, I mean, we've uh, a lot of us have been offered free corporate yoga, Pilates um, this year. Um, I mean, I, I do it myself for pleasure, but then there's, you know, what does it mean if we're being encouraged to do this by workplace? Um, so, so these practices have very, um, yeah, we, we exist in tension with them. And um, I, I guess one of the things that, um, yeah, the, the way you situated that so beautifully in our contemporary lives um, is, you know, how do we respond um, if we have this genealogical knowledge? How do we respond to these things um, when we're expected to participate? And, and I might go into a bit of depth about, um, well, not too much depth, um, but give a quick overview of how these questions arise for me as well. 
Um, I was so struck by the beauty of the Gilbreth's images, even as they erase the body. Um, and I had this sense of the, the kind of, it's the illumination, the enlightenment of workplace management in a sense, and this kind of um, the beauty of the science, scientificity um, that is presented um, is so uh, captivating. And at the same time, these are, if, if um, understood correctly, the images of Marais, of the athlete's body, right? The, the, the rippling muscular body. Um, you know, there's, a, there's the athlete, there's a superb human being constructed, even as they're being erased in motion as well. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that as well, about why particular bodies are being chosen by Marais as well. Um, and yeah, and, and also I loved that black kind of very COVID friendly suit that his assistant was wearing. Um, so the reason that like these questions are so alive for me is um, because my interest in phrenology, which was the science of reading character and intellect from head shape, which came about in the early 19th century um, and which has like, you know, um, ramifications now, which were still being practiced in the mid 20th century. So I might just share, um, if you'll bear with me, I'll just share my slides to show some of these um, changes over time in the way that body and mind is being represented. Now, have those slides come up? Yep. Great. Yeah, you can go into um, full screen if you, ah. yeah, there you go. That's um, so as you can see, like the early from very much of the anatomical tradition of the, this exploration of um, neuroscience. So the um, German chap that came up with it was um, a very skilled dissectionist. Um, and he was also trying to circumvent this problem that um, Marais encountered later in the 19th century of how do we externalize what is inside. Um, and so he posited that different parts of the brain perform um, particular functions and that if you um, kind of study the exterior of the head, you can get an understanding of the meat within. Um, it was then transformed into the kind of moral technology by the 1820s, 1830s, which you can see in the images on the, on the right. And then by the late 19th century, we start to see this kind of um, this imagery of the grid of, of numbers, of the, this kind of exactly what you say, Elizabeth, the, the rise of quantification that is um, coming up at this time. And then, um, and, and curiously, these people are trying to really overcome this problem of fit. Um, so square pegs and round holes. Um, so there was a guy in Sydney who was advertising in the mid 19th century, he could help people select um, ships crews as well by, you know, palpating sailors heads. Um, and which I think was about trying to pick crew who wouldn't run away as soon as they arrived um, at a gold rush site. Um, and then we see in the 20th century, it's translation into this mathematical form and also for the rain, world of business. So on the right, there's the um, lavery phrenometer um, doing a um, similar thing in some ways to what Marais is doing, although, you know, phrenology is obviously, we know now it doesn't have um, kind of, it's not grounded in a, in a reality, so to speak, but it was made real by these graphs, by these technologies, um, by an understanding that if you can um, perform a system, if you can perform a visual system, um, like this guy on the left did in the mid 20th century, Haywood Masters, that you can sort of um, position yourself um, in the business of um, square pegs, <laughs> um, making sure pegs go in the right hole. And then by the 20th century, these things translate into um, kind of the world of business. So um, just to wrap up, I mean, we live with psychometric testing as forms of um, workplace selection. Um, you know, I have, I have friends who um, are employed with management consultancy firms that have to do like quite extensive testing. Um, the Myers-Briggs test um, is a form of, 
of leisure as much as it is um, still applied in workplaces, even though the system is quite flawed. Um, if you've been on a dating app in the past few years, you'll see um, people on there saying, you know, hey, I'm an INTJ. Um, so how do we kind of, if we understand the genealogies of these forces, if we understand they come out of a particular moment and a particular kind of pressing instinct, which in this case is, um, in the case of character studies, how do we know if we can trust someone? What kind of tools can we put into place to, to trust someone? Um, then what do we do? How do we kind of move forward in our lives as we're being increasingly optimised and um, arguably automated as well? So thank you so much, Elizabeth. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. Elizabeth, did you want to um, give a, a quick response? Yeah, I'll give a quick response and then we can move on to Nikki. Alex, I love your material so much and I'm so looking forward to your book as well. I can't wait to read it. One thing I think is so interesting amongst the many in there, just to kind of map that onto some of the, the dynamics that I was just talking about, is like that movement. I don't know about the history of business chronology, but I, I'm going to find out for your book. But what I think is probably fascinating there is phrenology, of course, moves into the, the realm of the sort of self-help, self making you know culture at the end of the 19th century but it doesn't lend itself to it because your skull of course tends not to change shape and so it's a fixed thing and you're supposed to get a fixed out reading you know in phrenology according to the shape of your skull what is fascinating is that I love that image you showed like of the woman wearing the giant hat thing because I reckon what you're seeing then is the emergence of a kind of pseudo business neuroscience where you move from the skull which cannot change to the brain which you can say does change and then you can make your set of business practicals a form of self help and self-improvement because you can say that the brain is changing in a way that you can't say that the skull is so I that's the kind of the dynamic that I saw you know underlying there like how are we going to turn phonology into something where that people can use to improve themselves and I reckon that's probably it brilliant um um, I'll invite you back in a minute, Alex, but first I might throw to our second discussant, who is uh, Nicola Ridges, who is an Associate Professor within the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition at Deakin University. She currently holds a Future Leader Fellowship from the National Heart Foundation of Australia that is examining how youth accumulate their activity and associations with cardiometabolic risk factors. Her research focuses on utilising advanced statistical analysis to identify activity patterns throughout the day in order to inform the development of targeted interventions for building activity into daily lives. So a very different um, applied perspective on, on this idea of, of motion and tracking movement. So Nikki, um, would you like to give any comments for Elizabeth? Yes, yeah, so I just want to thank you, Elizabeth. That was a very fascinating um, presentation for someone who deals every day with movement and measuring movement. I find it fascinating that there was actually a resistance to, to measuring it in the first place. Um, so I guess when I'm sort of reflecting on what you've spoken about and how we've progressed from trying to understand movement and how, and as you mentioned, how to opt optimize move movement. Um, some of the work that we've been doing has actually been in workplaces in physically demanding workplaces where we're trying to get a sense of how much activity is actually accumulated during that time and thinking about can people sustain that period of work for, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours? If you're working with, you know, nurses, emergency room nurses, you want them to be able to maintain that level of activity across a long period of time because you don't want to be, um, you know, in need of help and for someone not to be able to perform their duties. So trying to understand how they maintain that activity, what's the, what's the optimal level of maintaining that activity? What's going to be, can they increase if they need to? Um, that has been a source of, uh, you know, of a research that we've been doing over the past few years. And it's quite interesting to see that they're actually very good. Their levels of activity stay very consistent across a shift. Um, you know, you can see at the start and the end, there's, there's drops because of the handovers, but very consistent. Same with firefighters in terms of 14, 16, sometimes even 18 hour, you know, planned burn and wildfire shift. So that's something that, you know, that we've been looking at, which, you know, possibly can comment, comment on in a little bit. 
But the idea that, as you mentioned as well, that they sort of those compensatory behaviors and the psychology of the compensatory behaviors, you know, that's something that, um, you know, again, we're very interested in is if you're doing a lots of activities, say, for example, you know, at work or you're optimizing work, what then happens in the home environment? And one of the things that we're trying to think about in terms of, um, you know, the activity is how it's accumulated. So if you're more active at work, you're less active at home or vice versa. And the way that I've described activity and activity patterns, it's a little bit like a Roman mosaic. If you focus on the big picture, you miss all the beautiful, intricate details that that makes up the mosaic. But if you focus on those individual pieces, you miss the whole the whole picture. And that's kind of what those original photographs really showed for me is that it's it's a human mosaic, really. It brings together the pattern of the movement, but into the big picture of what the, the start and the end result was. So that was that was that um, you know very fascinating. For, for me as well. I want to just quickly come back to this, um, this idea of, uh, of how to quantify activity. So in the early sort of 1950s, 1960s, people started to be able to quantify gait and, and posture. And it was really in the 1970s that people developed those first accelerometers that would be able to quantify, to quantify movement. And we've seen it go from, you know, very, very basic devices that, that people could wear that would quantify some movements to, I know there's going to be people listening who've got Fitbits that will measure their activity for as long as they keep the device charged, for example. So we are in a, you know, we're able to quantify so much movement um, and and that, and that's, it, it poses a challenge in itself because there's so much data around, as you say, it can influence on um, how much activity is being recorded at work, at home, you're meeting guidelines, health insurance. So this whole quantification component, whilst very interesting, and, and as you mentioned, around optimization, it also reveals a lot of information as well. So that's um, something maybe we can pick up in the discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there and, um, and hand back over. Right, Elizabeth, did you want to um, quick response? Yeah, there's so much to respond to um, in there. So, I mean, one of the things in terms of people's activities and their, their sustainability is that part of the the, um, the Gilbreth, unlike Taylor, are interested in decreasing fatigue as well as increasing productivity. Taylor only cares about one of those <laughs> things. And so it's actually the Gilbreths who, who really invent what, what becomes ergonomics as well, which is not long. You know, it's only 10 years after their time that people start using the term um, ergonomics. And so they do do things like um, they discover that the soap packers, for instance, will work better if they have a high stool to work on rather than standing all day. So they do actually do a lot of work a lot of their work is around not just speeding things up but actually seeing the ongoing um, effects of, of repetitive work um, on people's bodies as well so they do do um, a lot of work around that area so it's a sort of you know, interesting um, trajectory there but the other thing in terms of you, know, you mentioned sort of people quantifying gait and so on the other thing that is really interesting um, about both Marais and the Gilbreth's work I just didn't have space to talk about this here is that both of them um, look at people with different different physical conditions um, when they're doing their work as well, but particularly the Gilbreths because they're doing applied work. So the Gilbreths did a lot of work, um, you know, they're working in the like 1919, you know, in the early 20s is their like hot period where they're doing um, a lot of work in consultancy. And you have all those men coming back from the First World War um, as well with, you know, who have amputated limbs and, and you know, um, and so on. Um, and they actually did a lot Servicemen to some like some of the, the machine I showed like the date stamping machine they like they devised typewriters that could be used with one arm and so on so a lot of their work was actually when they were looking at um, correctives a lot of their work was like how do we use these technologies to enable people with different abilities um, to continue to be productive uh, we always with the assumption that it was like up to the individual to have the will you know to want to do this so they're, they're very much product of their time but but in fact that history around like the the tracing of different forms of movement of gait and so on is very integral um to a part of their work that i didn't talk about um at all today because there wasn't enough time yeah, so kind of. So I was just going to say, well, it's kind of where that maintenance has come from. So it's it's not just about the optimization; it's being able to maintain, and that's certainly something that is being reflected in the work that's being done at the moment yeah, as well. I, yeah, the, and the Gilberts really are amongst the first people working in the industrial sector. Um, a to say, look, we 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 can just change the tools, and then people can continue to work. The problem's not with the people. That actually is an initiative that came from this same mindset. Mm. 
Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I was just going to tie it into a question that's just come through uh, on YouTube from Mark Andreevich, um, who'd like to hear more on your reflections on, on the one best way as a norm. Uh, and we hear then the undercurrent uh, uh, and that under current data regimes norms, as it were, it's all about customizability, which you're kind of alluding to here, um, that everyone gets their own norm, subject, of course, to the demands of optimization. So can, are you able to speak a little bit to this um, uh, shift, or, or it doesn't sound like there was a shift, if it was there from the beginning, um, the idea of the one best way versus this, like, this era of personalization that we have at the moment? Yeah, the 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 applica the individual application of the one best way and the extent to which that can be tailored is less of the Gilbreth's focus than it is really um, trademarking <laughs> the the idea the catchphrase the one best way as a business strategy. So we can think of that as primarily a business slogan, um, I would say, but of course it does serve, you know, an important role um, in their work. So in there, they publish their case studies as well. So um, so what they do in their, their case studies is that they show you how to calculate the one best way properly using the Gilbreth, you know, proper techniques. And it's fantastically complicated. So part of the, the idea of the one best way is to show you that really you need to hire the Gilbreth to come in and work out the one best way for your factory. So of course it's customizable but in a way that is so difficult to apply that the Gilbreths are really the best place people to do it. So that is a big role um, and, and, and really because they, they are not the inventors of the term scientific management and they're in competition as much as collaboration with Taylor. So he owns the scientific management as a principle. The one best way is their attempt to have a phrase like that that they can use um, all over the place. But having said that, the term does take on a life of itself. So um, where Frank Gilbreth is actually in involved in the Gilbreth activity older than Lillian Gilbreth for one thing, but also he dies of a heart attack at 55, leaving her with 12 children and a business to run single-handedly. So her idea of, of time management is, is kind of propelled by her own personal needs, but she's also then a woman running an industrial consultancy single-handedly. She's the one who applies the one best way to the home. Frank Gilbreth does not do that. For him, it really is a business slogan, but what she does for the rest of her career, which then goes well into the mid-century, from 1920 into its second you know entity um, because she's working in the domestic space and so for instance is Lillian Gilbreth who designed the modern kitchen she was the one who said it's best if you're your because of course people had servants beforehand if they were middle classes or no kitchens you know quite often if they were living in apartments so the domestic kitchen is, is of the same period post world of post post world war period and she designs it to have all the the, um, the technology near you. So your oven and your fridge should be within arm's reach to make it more efficient. So she shows through kitchen redesign how the one best way can suddenly be applied to all these different spaces. And she comes up with like time management charts for all the children. So like all the stuff like, oh, while you're brushing your teeth, you can be learning your French conjugations by having on your times table, by having a sign up. And that application of the one best way to go from being a business model to being a principle of efficiency that can be applied to everyday life, that's its second life, if you like. And it's the Lillian Gilbreth form of the one best way that happens after Frank dies. So two answers to that question is because they're really two different things. Oh, brilliant. I mean, that um, the patenting that you were discussing, the sort of um, um, uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, claiming originality through the painting, the businessification of this um, is so apparent today. If you look at sort of the kinds of forms of workplace monitoring that we see. I, I'm thinking particularly of anyone who works at Deakin, we get my analytics updates from Microsoft. Um, and the language of that is really striking because it's, um, you get updates weekly on a Monday usually that breaks your time down in your week into time that you're collaborating and then available time to focus. So yeah. for, 
yeah so I'm constantly getting reminders of like you know I have a 90% capacity of time to focus <laughs> which I have no idea how it is being calculated um, but those are the two kinds of measurement we have for our days yeah it's that that dynamic that you're pointing out is the kind of power grab that it happens with the phrase the one best way because it used to be that workplace managers would come up to a particular workplace there'd be people who know how that but the one best way uh, one best way is a power grab it's saying like we the gilbreths know the managers know what that is and we will we will apply it to you without seeking your input oh, brilliant yeah i've got a question um, just a quick follow-up question on that that is about Lillian Gilbreth uh, and the interesting rise we see at the moment of the quantification of reproductive labour as well. Um, so uh, Alex, Alex gestured to this in the kinds of um, ways in which our workplaces are giving us free Pilates or free yoga or wellness tips, you know, as part of the, as part of the MyAnalytics software, it, it gives you well-being tips. Um, um, but they're, they're very interested in, in optimising your uh, relaxing time as well. And you see that in, in new iPhone models, for example, that give you downtime and it's time to switch off kind of things. I mean, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, and I've noticed that we were all getting the do lunchtime yoga, you know, tips that you can do on Zoom. <laughs> from your lounge room and 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 you know and and we also see this informally as well with the you know the the, the pot plant growing in the the banana bread making in the middle of a, a pandemic as well what i find interesting about it is is how hard it is for people to talk about like decompression or relaxation exercises and that's the full stop. That's the end of the sentence without it being because then it will make you be able to keep working in the afternoon. So, so you know, when I've had those kind of like wellness talks or, you know, productivity talks at university, I remember someone mentioning that it was quite OK to have an afternoon nap. They were quite a good idea because then you would be more productive in the afternoon. And I and I thought, what would it take to say maybe you're just cognitively overloaded and you need a nap? End. <laughs> for that to be the end of the sentence rather than to be a justification for more productivity. How hard is it for us in the middle of a pandemic to just like sit and stare into space and go, wow, like what, what a moment, you know, this is to just try and deal with. It's so hard for yoga to be about yoga. It's so hard for a walk in the park to just be, go listen to the birds, you know, for an hour. It has to be because then ha have a whole weekend off, like that's a rarity, because then you'll be super productive on Monday. Like what would it take for us not to put that part of the, that? That's the bit that I find fascinating about that that it's so if, if, if this moment won't do it like what will it is so hard for us to say this is a time to do less just do less sleep more relax more do less like what would it take for that message to get through <laughs> yeah I, I completely hear you there and we've got another question comes through on youtube from greg uh, Haynes. i apologize if i've mispronounced your name um, but he's asking if there are lessons to be learned from the history presented in relation to the possibility of optimizing systems and patterns of labor uh, for the worker as opposed to the manager. And it's almost what you're gesturing to here. For the worker, it's just like, I just need to stop. But for the manager, it's like, I, allow, I will allow you to stop because I know that it will allow you to keep going later on. Yeah, yeah. If I've got the phrasing of that um, that question right, um, you know, in terms of optimization from both sides, I mean, one of the things that I think in terms of worker optimization is that we're in the reason I was sort of gesturing um, towards this again, yeah, but I was also aware I was running out of time a bit, so I sped up. Um, but like one of the reasons that that we buy in to this both of us, workers and managers, and half of us don't even can't even separate those two activities because we have to manage ourselves you know these days which is the point that I'll I'll come back to so the reason that we both buy into it is that it does work and it is like if you if you get things done more efficiently you do as Lillian Gilbert promised us have time for more happiness minutes outside that or or time time to use in different ways so the if we could just say look it's just all a load of bollocks you know it's just made up a bunch of made up math it would be a lot easier to ignore the whole thing and we wouldn't be having a discussion about it now it, it has a hold on us because it works it's 
like if you if you're efficient in terms of managing your paperwork in terms of managing your time and so on there are good outcomes that comes from this that cruel optimism is a phenomena for a reason it, so but i think what is unique in terms of if the question is about so we know we know what the oppressive side of this looks like if the question is about what are the possibilities you know that that allows as well i will say we're in a we're in an interesting moment that that has considerable dangers as well in which we now have to often be our own workplace um, managers and so there are plenty of people working um, in you know fully in the gig economy these days who actually don't have even when other people are going into offices you know that the when we're not all in a work from home mode who don't have offices who don't have managers who actually have to do this um, themselves and that learning curve of how to self-manage you know for people who are who are self-employed who are working in the gig economy and other sort of precarious forms of employment it's even more pressing uh, to know how to do this and there's certainly and there's certainly plenty of devices and strategies and ideas and programs to help you do that but but I think that people are widely seeing I mean, I, I, I'm not kind of preaching anti-productivity here, I wish I could, but, but because, you know, I use these sort of strategies myself or I wouldn't manage the work that I have to do too. So I think that the same, all of the things that, that I've been talking about, and particularly the Gilbreth kind of extension of this into everyday life, that, that particularly that if you are efficient in your work life, that you have time for your home life, you know, with with a family or with friends, and um, and, and your domestic life in terms of the things that you have to do at home, or the principles of of being mindful about how you're spending your time um, to maximise that for your own happiness as well as for the things that have to do. All of those are strategies that both do have possibilities for for a widespread application and and the most of us actually do employ those um, in some way or another so it definitely can be used positively and it definitely has opportunities as well that most of us um, explore but I do think that the 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 widespread transformation in work at the moment and the widespread loss of the office and the manager is putting a lot of this stuff that used to be imposed in the workplace is now being absorbed as part of our our individual work practices so it's a very trans sort of transformational moment I think. Mm -hmm. Alex, you posted um, an interesting comment. Did you want to uh, incorporate that in? Yeah. One of my questions in, um, in response to Greg's question as well um, is, I guess, not so much um, something we can practice, but to keep in mind, which is that these experiments, which I think you gestured to as well, um, when talking about the Gilbreths, Elizabeth, in terms of the scientificity, um, that they actually didn't account very well for social factors. There's lots of, you know, so the Hawthorne experiments um, from the 1920s, which are really famous about things, you know, for things like how light affects us, how we fatigue. I mean, these emerge from the very complex dynamics between the experimenters and five bolshy working class migrant women um, who were affected by things like, um, so Richard, the historian Richard Gillespie writes about how, you know, the worker, the Italian worker who comes along and is um, becomes the most productive. She's the one who's also got the most to lose because she's having to support her family. The Great Depression rolls along. Um, and so she is productive because she has to be and she doesn't want to push back. Um, like the Mad Poles, which kind of warmed my Polish heart, um, because she, she, you know, there's a lot more riding on it for her. So, um, yeah, a lot of this wisdom that we, common wisdom, um, so, same with character typing, um, when we think of ourselves as um, a Myers-Briggs figure or something, you know, these are very, you know, contested, flawed um, processes that, have brought these systems of knowledge about. So I think it's often quite um, helpful to think of, um, you know, there's there's really um, rigorous, um, eloquent work like Nikki's work. And then there is also this work that is coming out of, in terms of management, as you point out, it's coming out of a corporate space, it's coming out of a self-actualization space where people are making themselves as consultants. Um, and we, we do have to take these things with a grain of salt. Yeah, it's such an interesting history. I love the way like so many of the early case studies 
involve like written accounts of the resistance of the, the workers who are the subjects of these experiments. So the Gilbros have all these stories where they're like, you know, they often work with women because the women's workplaces were less unionized. So they would go there. That's the reason they work in like all the soap making factories and stuff because they can they can run rampant, you know, in those kinds of places. So with them, it's exactly what you're talking about. They come up with this idea where the, they think the 10 hour workday is too long and they think an eight hour workday would actually be healthier, you know, for, for people less less fatiguing so they they try and roll this out um in a factory of soap workers but exactly what you mentioned comes up and that is that the soap workers are not at all interested in their ideas they spend all their time like gossiping and talking about they won't participate um in any of the the experiments but they do this for a very particular reason and that is that you know factories in the teens and the 20s were often they were very localized and so they were the central workplaces for all those small towns in the midwest of the states where you know a lot of these experiments are taking place and so the women knew that if their work hour went from 10 hours a day to eight hours a day because of increased efficiencies that they were going to watch a whole lot of their colleagues get sapped as a result of this and the extent to which you can see it because they talk about it explicitly taylor and the gilbreth are so frustrated because they keep telling people you personally you individual are going to earn more money as a result of of our the the you know the the um, new measures that we're we're introducing here, and no one cared. Like what they saw was that there was going to be mass retrenchments, and they were used to earning what they earned, and they would rather earn less, and for the for the individual to earn less and maybe even for longer hours and the collective, the, the neighborhood, you know, to, to remain employed, that was the priority for people there. That was what they understood as a collective functioning workplace system for them was that everyone stayed employed. And that tension between a worker collective attitude and the, the managers who come in and individualize everyone and they could not understand. Like Taylor thought people were just too dumb to understand what was in their own interest. Like, but I'm, I'm offering you more money you know if you do it this way that tension between and all the values that disappear along with that about sustainability about the kind of knowledge that's coming up through a system about collective well-being about the economy of a community and not just the economy of a factory all of this is what disappears as the one the one best way uh, gets introduced that's so fascinating that's so fascinating. I mean, one last thing that I wanted to sort of invite Nikki actually to comment on is for someone who's actually working with motion tracking in, applied in practice, um, uh, the kinds of intricacies that perhaps aren't captured in the data when you actually try and measure movement in people, particularly children who's you, who you work with. Yes, it, it's a challenge. And uh, I'll sort of just preface this a little bit. You know, when we were measuring, or when I first started measuring back in the you know, early 2000s, we could only measure children's activity for one day because of battery and memory capacity. So that's that's changed over the last sort of 15 years or so, so that we can measure more. But there's a, a, been a big push now to really understand how that move, movement is accumulated and understand the patterns in terms of can we identify using machine learning whether someone's walking, are they sitting, are they standing? You know, uh, and, and as you said, with, with children, you know there's going to be skipping and hopping and you know general play movements which are really hard to to discern so that's what that's another challenge that we've got now in terms of the the technology can provide so much insight but a lot of the the information in there can be quite hard to distinguish between those different behaviors so we've we've gone from really quantifying how much people do to trying to understand how they you know when during the day do they do it and now it's what what is that actual behavior looking like at that point in time that's the challenge at the moment. That's so interesting. It's funny because that's kind of what Marais was trying to do by having the intervals visible was that he didn't want the vision to sort of smoosh into one image. He wanted to see the breaks exactly so that he could, he didn't want too much data, if you like, so that he could see, start measuring between them. 
Yeah, we've got uh, just a few last questions coming through um, uh, on YouTube now. Uh, we've got from Trang Lei, who, who would love to know your thoughts on how these forms of quantification might potentially marginalise certain kinds of bodies, um, uh, and particularly women or people of colour, people with disabilities. So you have gestured to how actually these are supposed to compensate for, for disability, for example, or um, how Alex's example of these Italian women who have more to lose in this case and sort of um, uh, it's very interesting sort of the, the ideal norm this idea of you know we're all held hostage to the perfect productive body um, um, but the conditions with which that body is produced or why that body is chosen sort of uh, has effects for each of us in different ways. Yeah, look, that's a, that it's a bigger and really important um, question as well. So Marais himself, really, his prime subject was was Demony, his his assistant. So like he was mostly, uh, you know, spent a lot of his time photographing him. So that was his life, being in the the black suit. So Marais wasn't interested in a kind of a, a spectrum or a broad. I mean, he did he did photograph other people, but he was more sort of interested in the mechanics of movement, and he wasn't interested in looking at different body types. He, like he did very few um, photographs with women's bodies, for instance, none with with people that weren't white French people, you know, um, and so on. Demony himself was connected to the physical culture movement, um, so that so that's the the athleticism of the bodies that that Alex asked about. Like his and he tried to. Use Use Marais' ideas to introduce a kind of athletics system into the, the standard French education, which he succeeded in doing. Marais himself was really against it. He said, "You'll be boring a generation of French students. Why would you? Why would you impose physical education as a course of study on them?" So he was completely against doing that. So Marais really is a physiologist, and all he needs is a body to do work. So Demenez is the main body um, that he uses for that. The Gilbreths, of course, are very different. Um, and so they they do work with different populations, but they work mostly with working class white um, men and women um, who are a particular category at the time. They're called Native White Americans is the name of the communities that they were um, working with, which meant um, more that not first generation uh, white Americans is what that phrase meant. And it's a, it's a sort of a phrase that you'll see in a lot of scientific um, writing at the time. And they did work with a lot of women. What is interesting about about their work. I've mentioned that they worked with people with disabilities. Lillian Gilbreth wrote um, a book in 44, so just as men are starting to come back from the Second World War, called Normal Lives for the Disabled. Um, and the, the, the application, the use of the word disabled, is one of the early examples, because people say like handicapped or you know other terms like that um, beforehand so so they're they're part of a different way of thinking um, about bodies with different kinds of um, abilities and they worked a lot to to to, to work with people to adapt things um, especially for returned um, servicemen what's significant about that is that it's something that you see in the history of quantification which is that we often think and it's true like even the phrase the one best way implies that you're imposing or enforcing one standard and people everyone has to do it the right way but in fact the history of quantification is a history of negotiations between individual bodies and these numerical templates and it's very much what you see in like the history of ergonomics and so on um, as well is that in fact it's not the 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 mathematical formulas that are used are adapted and have to be adapted to the range of bodies that are being used. It doesn't make them liberatory, it just makes them um, adaptable. So it's, bit, it's kind of baked into the, the kind of, both the, the quantificatory um, formulas that they're using, but also the principles of management that they're using as well. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to squeeze in one very last question from the audience. Um, and this is from Rosie Boring, who's asking, you know, have these knowledges been taken up in policy in a similar way to how positive psychology, she says, which I argue is also a technology of responsabilization, has. So, for example, uh, its integration into education policy, for example. And perhaps um, Nikki might also have some insights into that. Yeah. Nikki, do you want to jump in first? I was going to say, did you want to, <laughs> and I'll jump in. 
Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, if you, yep. Okay, yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, we can trace the history through a whole range of different fields of quantification. Um, so, you know, you can see, for instance, um, intelligence testing, for instance, you know, comes out of this kind of um, history as well. So that's an example that sort of moves into the, um, the education sector as well. Um, and you can also see, like, um, the, the whole sort of a project around, uh, like, schools testing the the, the capacities of students, like their weight, their senses, like hearing and so on. All of this is coming out of we have to measure everything um, in the body. The person who invents that whole testing regime is actually Francis Galton. He's also inventing some of the early technologies for um, for recording the, the capacities of the body and invents the, the concept eugenics as well. So this is very much tied up, invents the idea of kind of improving um, the body, but these are all um, tied up together. So the, the history of quantum quantification does kind of go everywhere and it goes into the health sector um, as well. So the idea of BMI, for instance, you know, comes out of medical statistics, you know, in the 19th um, century. So it is kind of that that sort of regime um, is, is baked in everywhere. But it, I mean, it's also the subject of explicit discussion uh, at the moment as well. It's not like in terms of contemporary policy, I don't think that you could say that there is a lack of mindfulness of the history. And especially at the moment, I think there's a are going back like some of the work that Alex is looking at there's a sort of moment of going back to the um the 19th century people are sort of more aware of like the the context in which an idea like BMI was developed and then the range of places that it's been kind of imposed in the present day like, these two things actually aren't working at all so I think that there is in terms of the, the operation of contemporary um, institutions and, and disciplinary areas at the moment, you are actually seeing a moment of, of recognising where the history of this comes from and a bit of sort of reinterpretation of, of the, the, the kinds of bodies that the, the data was, um, was derived from. So the, the big example of this is there's been a whole bunch of books recently um, that have often won uh, many sort of scientific medals um, of women writing about the use of male bodies as all the models in medical testing and what happens if you're devising hearts that don't like artificial hearts that actually don't work in women's bodies because they're a different body size or what if like the drugs that we're taking aren't actually quantified for you know the size of an animal's woman's body and so on so you are seeing a lot of um sort of assessment of that history I think at the moment and Nikki did you want to add anything to that uh, particularly from the sort of education and policy perspective I mean, certainly from the uh, the school's perspective, you know, as we've mentioned, the quantification of movement, you can see how much children are doing during the day, for example, at school and at home. So that's really led to the the, the rec recognition that the school can play an important part in contributing to activity. So there's there's a move towards this whole school approach of, of promoting activity throughout the day. So active lessons, active breaks, you know, opportunities during recess and lunchtime, supportive school environments, and um, active transport to and from school so it, it's thinking about how can we and again how do we optimize activity or maximize activity across the whole day so that you would know the children are active and that, that contributes to their health excellent well we're right we're a little bit over time now so uh, and i'm mindful of that so i will end our seminar today by thanking our, our speaker, Elizabeth Stevens, thanking our discussants, Nikki Ridges and Alex Raginski, and of course, thanking the audience um, for your wonderful questions um, uh, and for joining us or for what is sort of a seminar that's come very late in the year. Um, so after this, I plan to sort of take a nap full stop. <laughs> And I hope you do as well. So thank you everyone and we'll see you next year. Bye.